Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Turfgrass Epistemology. My name is Travis Shaddix. You're here because you're wanting to know how we know what we know about turfgrass science. I am a former, well, what am I a former of? Former yard maintainer, former university groundskeeper, former sports turf manager, former golf course hand. What else? former uh, assistant professor, University of Florida, University of Kentucky. Now I'm a stay-at-home dad, and it's bedtime at the Shaddock's household, so I'm a little bit late. Welcome, everybody. We have a lot of good stuff tonight. We have uh, one of the most important papers that I'll ever go over on potassium tonight. We have one of the biggest influencers on, in lawn care. A video from him tonight. We have a video of one of his victims tonight. Uh, we have a little add-on at the end with a little Easter egg for two of my buddies in Oklahoma. Something new to try tonight at the very end of the show. So we have a lot of stuff going on. It's going to be a fun night. Probably going to be a little long, but I'll try to get done in an hour, hour and a half, but we'll see how it goes. Welcome to everybody in chat, Internet Surfer, Jeremy Bosch. Gray Fox, Andrew Burst, Brady419, here we go, yes sir, Chuck Benzing, Connecticut Kubanikin, Super TA, and Todd Schomburg, Schomburg, welcome. I realized I was, I was scolded after the, what was it, last, on Wednesday morning, or Tuesday morning, I had two of my members give me a super chat, and because I have no idea what I'm doing, I didn't um, handle that correctly. I was I was told afterwards, um, you're supposed to acknowledge their chat and like you know verbalize what they asked. <laughs> like I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't know what I was doing. So I apologize for those two members that gave me a super chat, and I just said they super chat and didn't actually read their chat. But I'm learning. You got to bear with me, okay? I may only be in my 40s, but I'm going on like 80. <laughs> so. Reed Grevin, it's party time. Yes, it is. We're going to have a fun night. Let's get started because I, I could be here for a while and um, who knows what's going to happen. So first of all, thank you for all the members. We uh, at this point have 25 members, I think it is. And as you all know, I, I didn't think I'd get 25 views on the channel. And now we're up over a thousand member, a thousand subscribers and 25 members. And um, I just I don't know what to say other than thank you. I mean, you know, what's looking very promising in this channel and uh, my dream would be to have this channel have enough revenue to pay for itself and to support some of the turf grass research that I do and be able to include you all as members and as contributors to that in the research and to kind of keep you informed and show you how it works and so forth. That'd be a really uh, great thing to, to happen. So if it keeps going in this direction, we, we may end up getting there. So. Thank you for all that, what, what you all do for your as members. Nathan Jones. Oh, you're an Oak. Hello from an Oakey and an OK State alum. Oh, okay. I wonder where, I wonder if you're still in Oklahoma. So uh, I lived in Oklahoma for 20 years, lived in Florida for 20 years, and I hope to stay in Kentucky for the next 20 years. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm from Oklahoma. And uh, middle of Oklahoma, no one's ever heard of it, unless you're from Oklahoma, called Shawnee. And uh, I have a little Easter egg for two of my Shawnee buddies at the end of the show tonight. And uh, so I already texted them and let them know that there's going to be a little little shout out to them at the end of the show. Something new. At the end, we're going to have a little, I, I did a little short little fun thing at the end. And just to let everybody know, <laughs> okay, <laughs> is that I am aware that I'm copying somebody else or some something else okay that's the point <laughs> okay <laughs> so don't come back and say oh well you you just got that from so and so and you just got yeah i know i just got it from so and so okay i think it's funny <laughs> so we're putting it out michael conroy thank you for your membership that's 26 now i think and stephen bugerin but buggerin i'm sorry i don't know how to pronounce your last name stephen thank you for your membership and that really means a lot and so for those on that note Obviously, the memberships go to support the channel and to keep the channel running, but uh, if you're new to the channel and you're unaware of sort of what I do, there's I've explained it in a previous episode or two, but 
the intention is to have it support and all the supplies and everything else I need to keep the channel on the air to help communicate to you all what is the evidence of turf grass management to kind of cut through all the marketing BS and all the salesmanship that you see on YouTube and elsewhere around the, around the industry and kind of just go straight to the point when you look at the evidence in the scientific literature and anything that goes, uh, and once everything gets paid for and everything's uncovered, then I also do research on the side and that, that costs real money to do that. And so my intention is to use the membership revenue and so forth to, to pay for that. So if you're not keen on paying for memberships on a YouTube channel, I get that. But if you ever wondered, man, I'd like to contribute to, to turf grass research. How do I do that? Well, this is one way you can do that. Just become a member of this channel and I'll include you in, in all the, uh, um, all the expenses of, of research and include you on all the profits and losses and how things cost and how things operate and all that stuff. So, uh, if that's what you want to, if that's what you want to know, if that's what you're interested in doing, you can also, um, become a member and, and fulfill that interest that you may have. Okay. Um, I explained the super chat mistake I made. The podcasts are loaded. Don't forget this also goes loaded on the podcast the next day. We're up to almost a hundred, a hundred. I've sat here a hundred times in each, some of these episodes are more than an hour. So the, I don't I think we're at 95 or six or something like that. So I'm up, there's about to be a hundred articles, hundred scientific articles with, with, um, explanation and critique on them. Load it on the podcast, load it on my YouTube channel, and they're all turf grass. Uh, you know, I'll lose track of time before I know it. I got 100 podcasts on there. So um, any of your podcast platforms, you can, have, you can go there and listen to it as well. Uh, let's get into the videos, and then we'll go to the scoreboard, and then we'll get into the article. So the video today comes from a channel called Yard Mastery. It's about pot potassium. We're going to listen. It's only two minutes long. I, I, I always say this. I'm not going to stop it. Because, I, but I always always end up stopping it. But I'm gonna get through this because the, my interest is not necessarily the uh, misinformation provided by this guy. It's it's the impact he has on other people. Because I'm gonna show another video right after this and show you exactly how this misinformation can convince other people and start going down the the wrong road. And before you know it, the industry is just all, all out of whack. <laughs> okay, so that's the intent of showing this this video tonight. Let's get to it. All right, so today we are talking about Stress Blend Fertilizer. Stress Blend is a 7020 analysis, which means 7% nitrogen and 20% potassium. Most of that nitrogen is slow release, got a little ammonium sulfate in there to give you a kick, but the 20% potassium is the real story with this fertilizer. Potassium is great for lawns that are under stress. That can be stress from going in or out of winter. It can be stress from heat and drought, stress from insects or disease. This is what you want to use when the lawn seems to be stressed. And we've been going over this for a while. I can't, st I can't let the whole thing go. I, it's not in me. <laughs> it's just so much nonsense. I just, I just can't let it go. But um, he doesn't know if what he's saying is true. I bet, I bet money he hasn't read two scientific articles in his entire life, much less scientific literature on potassium, on turf grass. And we've, we've gone over, I'm going to put the scoreboard up here in a little bit. And you're going to see the scoreboard. Now, from this point forward, I'm going to start sewing potassium literature that shows a positive impact, okay? So the scoreboard's a little bit slanted one way right now. But it ain't going to change a whole lot. Um, so, but he doesn't know. He, and he doesn't care. He doesn't care. If he cared, he'd take the time to actually read the literature, or at least read the University of Florida literature on potassium and turf grass. And it doesn't matter to him. What matters to him is to convince somebody to buy his product. And I bought that product. $40 for an 18 pound bag, $4,400 a ton. Absolute insanity. Much less, besides that, really, you're buying and putting out um, potassium, and we've been going over that, that almost never results in a turf grass response, even in Florida, even on the sandy soils in Florida, which I was there. I, I, was, the, I was a researcher there. I wrote the potassium papers at the University of Florida. Even on those soils, potassium deficiencies are extremely rare. But we're putting out tons of potassium. And even if there was a potassium deficiency and you're going to actually cure it, the solution is not a 7020. Okay. And which we went over already. And I'm going to go over it again on Monday morning or Tuesday morning. It's usually a two to one in decay. And he doesn't care. He doesn't care. And then what ticks me off the most is not this, because he's a capitalist. He can do whatever he wants, is how his actions impact other people. That's what bothers me the most. I'm going to show a video right after this that really you know, is a victim of this 
misinformation machine. Let's keep going. Now, we could talk about that for cool season lawns. That's Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, turf type tall fescue and fine fescue. They're gonna be under stress like in the summer when it's really, really hot. You'll probably notice your cool season lawn really slows down. It wants to stay green. It wants to try to grow, but it really slows down from the stress of that heat. And that's where Stress Blend comes in to give you some nice green up to keep things healthy, but not push major flushes of growth. Now with warm season turf, that's Bermuda, Bahia grass, uh, centipede. By the way, I've never heard it called Bahia grass. Is, is that the way you all pronounce? I don't know if that's normal in the lawn care industry, but it's pronounced Bahia. I don't, I don't know where he heard, got that from, but maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. In the scientific community, we've always referred to it as Bahia grass. But maybe, the, maybe we're wrong. I don't know. Bahia. I've never heard Bahia. I've never heard anybody pronounce it that way. Maybe, maybe he's right and we're wrong. I don't know. Keep going. Uh, St. Augustine grass, zoysia, those grasses, they're going to want to be more chill like in the springtime. They kind of ramp up slow. So we give them stress blend to bring them out of the winter slowly. The other thing that we have here is a really good complement of micronutrients to support. We've got uh, manganese in here. We've got iron. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Oh I, oh, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. I've gone over iron. I went over iron for a month, didn't I? How many, how many responses to, to, how many responses to granular iron did I show? I showed one, I think there was out of how many articles, 16 or something articles. And that one was a very unusual case. You're not going to see a turf grass response to granular iron sulfate or granular iron EDTA. Not at these rates. EDTA, I guess it's possible. But you'd have to, you'd have to grossly overapply. You'd have to apply, you know, way, way higher rates than you would ever apply in a blended fertilizer. But he's got iron and manganese and zinc and magnesium in these blends. I've done, I've published work on magnesium. I've published work on iron. I've published work on manganese. All on St. Augustine grass. All in Florida. And the likelihood of seeing response to any of those on the sandy soils, the intasols, which is where, around where he lives, those deep, you know, 10 meter deep sandy soils. That's where I, what I said, 10 meter deep sandy soils. Even on those sandy soils, you're still not going to see a response very frequently, if at all, from magnesium, granular magnesium, granular iron, or granular manganese. But he's got it in that blend. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, let's keep going. Chelated iron, and we have water-soluble magnesium and zinc, which are also excellent to support lawns that are under stress. Yeah, well, there's probably just as many dis uh, harmful effects from zinc in the literature as there are hel helpful. I think we even showed an article or two that showed a, a harmful effect of zinc on, on uh, turf grass. <laughs> well, you know, the... It just blows me away. It just, I, I, I watch this stuff and just giggle. But I have to step back and empathize a little bit with the audience in the sense that I imagine there's a large major, a large portion of the YouTube audience and perhaps my audience as well. Good evening, Estepon Campos. That probably believed this stuff. Maybe even still believes it. We got to apply magnesium and zinc to turf grass to help the stress. They may, they may still believe that. This is epistemology. The question is, how do you know? How, do, how does he know? He, do, he doesn't know. He doesn't know. I'm convinced that he doesn't know. But he can say it and people believe it. That's, that's the problem. Okay, we have, and the only thing we can do is arm ourselves with critical thinking skills. Because this is never going to end. Right. This nonsense on YouTube, it's going to find some other avenue or have some way else to get into your, your world. And, you, and you're never going to be able to avoid it, but you will be able to recognize it and identify you know, the flaw and guard yourself against this stuff if you just have some critical thinking skills, which is what I'm hoping we're developing. Let's continue.
Now, one thing I do want to point out as well is, just like all Yard Mastery fertilizers, this fertilizer is spiked with Bionite. Bionite is our all-natural additive that we put in there to help feed the microbes in the soil and increase carbon. Okay, that's it. And then he just goes on and tries to sell the product. Bionite, I don't know where he gets it from. There's Jacksonville has a, a, a sludge that they, they generate out of Jacksonville. There's one in Tampa. There's one out of Houston. There's ones, there's many all over the place. And for the most part, he's right. It's just a Milorganite clone. There's, they're all, they have to get rid of that material somewhere. And the, ironically, one of the better places to get rid of those materials is a plant like turf grass. But we need to apply that based upon the phosphorus rate, not the nitrogen rate. And what he can get away with, not just him, but anybody can get away with, is that that product has phosphorus in it. If it has that natural organic in there, there's phosphorus in that product. But it's so low, it's not le he's not legally required to label it. So I forget the law in Florida. But if it's below a certain percentage, they don't have to acknowledge that it's in the fertilizer. So it's probably like 0.5% or something or 0.2% in the bag or whatever it is. And they don't have to label it. So it's, this bag's labeled a 7020. But the, it, there is phosphorus in that fertilizer. I would bet money on it. If there's a natural organic from a municipal biosolid, then that's, there's some in there, which, you know, you know, whatever. But let's get on to what I'm really interested in. So he had this, I can't remember his name. It's the, uh, he goes by the lawn care nut, but the, the, I think, and I think he owns this company called Yard Mastery. I don't really know. I could be wrong on that. But, um, but he, he's all over the stress blend and you got to apply all this potassium and all this, you know, jargon is just complete and other just BS. Um, but it is, you know, you, you and I can sit down and come up with a fertilizer right now and call it stress less or something. And we could start selling it too. There's nothing, no law against it. Um, but it is a very wasteful approach to turf grass management. And in some cases it can be harmful. So let's go to the next video. And this video comes from a, a YouTube channel called here we mow again. And I'm going to start it at zero. It's not very long, um, but I'm going to, um, I'm going to show you what sort of impact the lawn care nuts misinformation machine can create. Let's listen to, I think his name is Jeff here at Here We Mow Again, the YouTube channel. Uh, let's go. Hey guys, welcome back to Here We Mow Again. I'm Jeff and this is Billy. So a week ago, I put down the 7020 stress blend and I wanted to review the results with you guys and see how it came out. So let's go take a look. Okay, so very, very straightforward entry. You put it out and we'll see how it, how it looks. Now, if anybody here, I know I'm on a little bit of a delay, so I'll give it a little, little pause if I can. But if anybody here can identify the flaw in this, in Jeff's reasoning, which I'm sure he, you know, it's no harm to, I mean, it's not intentional on his part, but it's extremely common flaw. Very, I don't know if it's the most common, but it's got to be at the top of the list on the most common flaws in the turf grass industry. If anybody can identify that, we want to play a little game or something, <laughs> we can put it in the chat as to what flaw he's committing it, through his, Ration, rational thought. I mean, or his epistemology. I mean, what flaw crept in? And I'm going to skip forward to here. So let's let's watch the rest of this. I'm going to skip ahead a couple of the more the more important parts, and then I want you to see if you can think about what flaw he committed to try to improve that soil. But take a look at this. Take a look at the improvement here, and I'll try to put up a before picture as well. I mean, this definitely is still not perfect. There's still some patchy areas in here, but wow. This is a huge improvement over what it was just a week ago. Okay, so he showed his lawn and said, oh, wow, this is a huge improvement. So now he's seeing something after he put out the 7020, and he says, hey, this is a, doesn't look great, but it looks better. Okay, now let's move forward to a little bit ahead. So here's another shot of that area right in the back here. It's definitely looking a heck of a lot better. So this shows me that the potassium definitely works in this, this bag of stress blend. Okay. So we put it out. He says, oh, it looks better. It's a 7020 with iron, magnesium, and all sorts of stuff in it. He puts it out. 
he visually sees, oh, it looks better. And then he says the following. It's definitely looking a heck of a lot better. So this shows me that the potassium definitely works in this, this bag of stress blend. Shows him that the potassium definitely works. It's going to be hard for me to sit here for 15 seconds and not say something for, until the delay hits you guys. But what's that, what's that flaw? If anybody can think of it. We've, I've gone over it before. I have a standalone video on it bef on, already on the channel. And yes. Yeah, so that's all. So Mike Conroy says response from nitrogen, not potassium. Gray Fox says, how would you know it's from the K? Super TA says, has it naturally waking up on his own? You know, Chuck in the wild ass guess, confirmation bias. It was, yeah, it was, and then Andrew Burr says it was the nitrogen. <laughs> Kinetic King Kermana says the rooster crowing fallacy. So you're all hitting right around it. And, and the rooster crowing fallacy, the postdoc echo prop doc fallacy is, is also one. That's also true, Kinetic King Kermana, and that is true. And it is, Andrew, and that's all confirmation bias, true. You all are hitting all around it. And you're not wrong when you say confirmation bias. You're not wrong when you're saying it's the postdoc error prop doc. That's not, that's all that's true. So there's more than one. I mean, but they're, so they're all working together. But what this is, and you're, and you're right about the nitrogen, the people, Mike Con, Michael Conroy and, and Gray Fox and all you said, you know, all that. You're right about that. This is another example of the composition division fallacy where he puts out a blend that contains multiple things and he puts it out and you see a response. And then you attribute it to one thing in that blend because the entire blend resulted in a response. I have very much, I have a great deal of confidence that he put that out and he saw a response. I'm, I'm not doubting that at all. But then when you attribute it to one part of the whole, that's the composition division fallacy. As it is the confirmation bias and as it is the post hoc ergo prop talk fallacy. So we're learning. <laughs> I'm excited. You, you guys are getting, you probably already knew all that already, but, but you know, your responses are right in line with what I was, was hoping to hear. We can't put out a blend on any situation and, and then claim that it's from one item within that blend unless we balance out all the, all the other components. And somebody else in here said, um, who said, uh, oh, Super TA, the grass is naturally waking up on his own. And that's a, that's another foul. That's another flaw that he not you, uh, uh, super TA. But you're correct. In other words, how do you know it wouldn't have occurred already on its own? You went from one time of the year to fast forward a week or fast forward two weeks. That's a different time of the year. The grass it could be. Who knows? It could be in the spring. Could be in the fall. Could be in the summer. Who knows what's going on? Because you didn't have a control. You don't know what would have happened in the absence of your application. What would have happened in the absence of nitrogen? Right. So these are all really great responses, and it, and, it, and it kind of helps me gain some confidence that we're, we're building our critical thinking skills, and we're, we're healthily skeptical. Healthy skepticism um, leads to critical thinking, and critical. it's all part of the same epistemological approach, and, and that's, that's what I wanted to, to make, make sure we're clear. And this particular name, Jeff, is, I think is his name, this is in no way a knock on him at all, because what he's, what he's doing is extremely common. You put it out, you saw a response, it must be from the potassium, because the bag says stress blend on it. Okay, that must be what it's from. But as, you, as the members in the chat have already confirmed to me, is that we're learning that, no, you, you can't say that. You don't know that. How do we know? Well, we don't know in this case. But you think that's going to stop the manufacturers and distributors from putting stress blend on there and spreading it out and putting it out? No. No. You think all my, all my articles and six or seven articles I'm going to go over on the scoreboard here in a minute that shows all the, neg all the negative effects and all the no effects are going to stop them from bagging it up and selling it? No. <laughs> They're going to keep selling it. But what we can do is arm ourselves with, with evidence and protect our money, <laughs> protect our environment if, if it's phosphorus and nitrogen. Okay, by not putting out this weight, these wasteful products, very wasteful. And in some cases with potassium, it can actually be more than just wasteful. It can actually be harmful to your turf. That's right. If you're new to the channel and you don't know, applying potassium can harm your grass. The, the uh, 
the poll I put up a couple days ago was up to 185 votes, I think. And 85%, the question was, before watching turf grass epistemology, were you aware potassium can result in turf grass harm? And 85% said, no, we, I was not aware. So this gentleman is right in line and it, you know, it's, and I'm here to, you know, hopefully using this as an example to, to help him in the future, as well as everybody else listening. We, we want to do things, whether it's mowing or fertilizing or airifying or whatever it is, we want to engage in management practices only when we have a good reason, an evidence-based reason. And one of the major um, arguments in support of that is some of our management practices that we think are helpful might actually be harmful. And if we don't have a good reason to include it, it's best to exclude it because it could be harmful and you don't even know it. Okay. That's it on that video. Okay, now let's get to the scoreboard. Now, we've been going over potassium, and this is the scoreboard. We have a, whoops, we have, if I can get my pen. Okay, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine articles we've gone over. We're going to go over another one tonight. That'll be 10. And of those nine, all nine concluded that the application of potassium resulted in no response. Seven of those nine also included a negative response. And only three of those nine actually concluded there was a positive response and all three of them were in yield. Now, this positive column is going to start filling up in the next, uh, between now and next Thursday night. There's going to be several in this positive column. But they're going to be very specific. And the solution or cure, or the, the response, I should say, of the potassium comes at very low rates. Not a, seven, not a 7 0 20. <laughs> okay. They come at very low rates of potassium. Okay. Yeah, Looney, there's a scoreboard. Looney asks, is there a scoreboard? Yeah, this is the scoreboard. Can you see it? Looney became a member tonight. Thank you. This is the scoreboard. We're three positive, nine, or nine with nothing, and seven negatives. This is pro the positive and the negatives are probably going to about equal out. But the, when we're done, when we're said and done with potassium, but the, the, just keep in mind, the positive responses come in very unique cases. For example, the Malik 1 in this Sartain study was a Malik 1 of 10. In that particular soil, the Malik 3 would have been around 11. Extremely low potassium. Okay. Okay. So that's the scoreboard. Wanted to bring that up so I don't, everybody can see it. And, uh, everybody can see it. So things have, Gonna have to. Looney says gonna have to see when that showed up. Oh, the scoreboard. Oh, I, I tried. To, I think I've been putting it up mo most of the days. I think, but I usually just put it up at the beginning of the show. All right, let's get going. It's nine thirty, and I got to get going. And now, now I'm gonna say this. You you might search the literature for fifty years and not find a better potassium paper written by a better team than the one we're gonna go over tonight. So, it, I mean, it, I, I can't find one. This is, this is one of the best papers, in my opinion, ever written on potassium. Okay? This was provided at the European Turfgrass Society Conference. It was published in Agronomy Journal in 2018. So, you can go over to agronomy.org right now and, and find this paper. It's entitled, Potassium Nutrition Effects and Thracnose on Annual Bluegrass. Okay? And the authors are by Charles Schmidt, who had another paper or two on potassium over in Rutgers, uh, Dr. Clark and Dr. Murphy. Both of these, well, I don't know Charles. I don't know if I've ever met Charles, so I don't want to leave him out. Um, but Bruce Clark and Jim Murphy are, I mean, find two better researchers than those two guys. I mean, I think Bruce, Dr. Clark is, I think, either in phase retirement or just retired, but if you've never gone to the Rutgers field get field day and it's in New Jersey, obviously Rutgers in New Jersey, you, you might want to 
take some time and go to that thing because it's one of the better field days you'll attend. It's, they do a really good job. Um, the facility there is not, I mean, just great. Just go. Okay. <laughs> just go to, go to the, the Rutgers field day and, um, you won't, you won't regret it. John Fetter asks, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Propter hoc, yes. Propter it means after this, therefore, because of this. It, you can't always connect just because something happened after you did it. Doesn't mean that what you did caused it to happen. And the, the famous analogy is because the rooster crowed and the sun come up afterwards, people for a long time thought the rooster crowing caused the sun to come up. But of course, we know that doesn't happen. Okay. Let's get to the article. Potassium nutrition effects anthracnose on annual bluegrass. Few studies have been conducted comparing the effects of potassium source on cool season turf grasses due in part to the limited availability of potassium sources. In most cases, it's going to be KCL or SOP. So that's murate of potash or sulfate of potash. And the difference is they're both salts. KCL is has a higher salt content or a higher burn potential, if you want to call it that, than sulfate of potash. And of course, sulfate of potash comes with sulfate as well. So whenever, especially today, it wasn't so much of a big deal 20 years ago, but nowadays, if I can, if you can afford it, if I, I don't think there's any reason to apply potassium in 99% of the cases, and that's what the literature supports. But in occasions where you need potassium, I would use potassium sulfate. If you, in occasions you might need sulfate, and the response from potassium sulfate is probably coming from the sulfate itself. And the, the least expensive sources of sulfate or potassium sulfate, gypsum, and ammonium sulfate, if you include the cost that you would offset by including the nitrogen in the ammonium sulfate. So if you, if you have a sulfate deficiency, uh, potassium sulfate can help alleviate that. And it is a relatively, relatively, it's one of the least expensive sources that you can use, as opposed to, say, magnesium sulfate or manganese sulfate or something like that. Anthracnose is a destructive fungal disease of cool season turf grasses that is exacerbated by stresses such as heat and drought. Numerous studies have examined the effects of nitrogen fertilization in reducing anthracnose severity. However, until recently, the impact of potassium fertilization on this disease was unknown. Schmidt in 2017 found that potassium nitrate applications reduced anthracnose severity on annual bluegrass on an annual bluegrass putting green compared to other nitrogen sources. Ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, calcium nitrate, potassium nitrate, and urea. So it was potassium nitrate resulted in less anthracnose than those other nitrogen sources, but it was unclear whether the response was due to potassium or due to soil pH changes. And if I recall, I, I might be wrong on this, but I was either at the European when they talked about this paper, or I was either or maybe it was at the International when it was at when it was held at Rutgers, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. I don't know if Dr. Clark was talking about it or not. I can't remember, but I remember watching that someone talking about that research project where they saw a re reduction in anthracnose from potassium nitrate compared to the other nitrogen sources. And it's my understanding that this project was a result of that conclusion. They, were like, they didn't really know. And then they went and did another three-year study to say, okay, well, is it from the potassium in the potassium nitrate? Or was it from some sort of pH influence from like say ammonium sulfate and, uh, or ammonium nitrate influencing the pH or calcium nitrate, you know, right, right? Does that make sense? So they weren't sure if it was from potassium or from something else. And that's why this, that's how this study came to be. And I may be wrong on that, but for some reason in the back of my head, I remember somebody saying that at a, at, a, at a meeting once. Several studies have shown that potassium fertilization can decrease the severity of turf grass diseases, and he provides some citations for these. Okay. Alternatively, other studies have shown that potassium fertilization had no effect, little or no effect on disease severity. And there's a whole list of other citations. In contrast, several studies have shown that potassium fertilization can increase the severity of, of a Tif, tif, I don't know how you say that, tifulabite, tifulabite on perennial ryegrass, annual bluegrass, and creeping bentgrass, and microdochium on annual bluegrass and creeping bentgrass. And he has citations for that. So he's saying that there has been some information about potential reduction of diseases. There's other citations that show nothing happens. And indeed, there's other citations that show it increases diseases, potassium, the application of potassium. So it's all over the place. Okay. 
since since there since no clear pattern in disease response to potassium fertilization has emerged in turf and previous research has shown that potassium can reduce stress and may affect anthracnose severity, there is a need for additional research to ascertain the effects of potassium fertilization on a stress-related disease, such as anthracnose on annual bluegrass putting green turf. The primary objective of this study was to determine whether potassium source or rate influences anthracnose. I, I can't even read this. I mean, <laughs> hang on a second. I mean, literally, and in May, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this paragraph again because I totally effed it up. In May, I'm going to go over some mental health stuff, but internally, I want you to know what's going on internally. I'm jittery. I'm so happy and excited to read this paper. You have no idea. I'm about to cry even thinking about the work that they did and the forethought that went into this paper. It just is so important that, that people understand what's going on here with this potassium. They're not looking at just potassium. They're looking at potassium sources over three years. I mean, it's a lot of work and <laughs> I got to read this again because I'm like, Internally, I'm shaking because I'm so excited to read this paper. Uh, okay, let me, I'll edit that part out in the, in the final cut. <laughs> okay, let's start over. Okay. The primary objective of the study was to determine whether potassium source or rate influences anthracnose severity and overall performance of annual bluegrass turf. And if so, to establish potassium sufficiency ranges for annual bluegrass turf based on soil test levels and tissue concentrations. So he's going to have... He's, they're going to have in this thing malic 3 critical levels, tissue critical levels, and how those critical levels are properly cor correlated to turf quality and this disease. I mean, I, if people understood how difficult this is and how long it takes to get this stuff going and how expensive it is, I, I, I think they would share my jubilance. It's just, really, it's just really cool stuff that they did there, and they have really good graphs in this paper. I mean, I, I probably won't even read much of the results because the results are so well shown in, in the graphs. It, it's really good. A three-year study was conducted on 10-year-old annual bluegrass turf mode at 2.8 millimeters and grown on a top-dress-derived mat, a um, turfgrass-derived mat layer, overlaying a Nixon sandy loam, okay, at the Rutgers Horticultural Farm Number 2 in North Brunswick. Oh, I don't think I went to that one. I think they have, they, have, they have two, and I don't think I went to the North Farm. Yeah, that may be at the other farm. Anyway, during 2012, 13, and 14, soil probe observations indicated that the root system of the annual bluegrass was confined to the mat layer. This is going to become important because they're going to talk about potassium in the mat layer versus potassium in the normal soil depth, like three or four inches or six inch soil depth. And what they're saying is when they were taking the soil probes, all the roots were in the thatch. I mean, in the, in the mat. Oh, not the thatch. All in the, were in the mat. So they didn't take the sample from the entire soil profile. They just took it from the mat layer because that's where all the roots were. This is Poania, right? Malik 3 extractable potassium concentrations in the mat and soil layer were 18 in the mat, 74 in the soil layer. Concentrations in the mat and soil layer were, oh, 18 of 74. Okay. Which ranked as very low and high respectively, based on the Rutgers Soil Testing Laboratory recommendations. Okay, so 18 and 74. And they're going to be most all their, all their data, is, all their graphs and everything are going to come from the mat layer K, is what they're going to call it, mat potassium. I think that's why they denote it. Okay, the treatment design. The experiment had 10 treatments applied from April to November each year. A component of the treatment included a 2x3 factorial of potassium source. So factorials, if you don't know, factorials account for all combinations of rates or of levels, so treatment levels. In this case, we're looking at source and rate as levels. And so if you have two sources and three rates, there's going to be so many combinations that you have to, if you're going to have every single combination of every rate and treat, rate and source. And that's what a factorial is. They do a two by three KCL and, K, and potassium sulfate, and then they have three rates. So they have two K, uh, they have KCL and SOP, and then they apply the potassium in three rates. And the rates were... Oh, did I hit the wrong button here? The rates were 1 point... I don't know why they chose these rates. It's really an odd rate. But the rates are 1.1, 2.2, and 4.4 pounds per thousand. I'm not really sure why that was specifically chosen. but And then they have two other potassium source treatments, potassium nitrate and potassium carbonate, at a rate of 4.4 .4 pounds of potassium per thousand, and two control treatments. One was no potassium, henceforth referred to as nitrogen alone, 
Okay. And the other one was a potassium fertilization. KCL applied at 4.4 pounds without nitrogen fertilization, here, here, henceforth referred to as potassium alone. So they have an N alone treatment and they have a potassium alone treatment and they have potassium nitrate and potassium carbonate applied only at 4.4 pounds, but they have KCL and KSO, KSOP or SOP applied at 1.1, 2.2, and 4.4 pounds a K per thousand. And then the, he has an explanation here, but I don't fully understand it. The K rates of 1.1, 2.2, and 4.4 pounds were achieved by applying potassium at the following rates, respectively, 16 times over a 28-week period every seven days. So they're applying it once a week. And then they applied it every two weeks for 13 applications. So they basically, they're spoon-feeding it out there on a putting green between April and November of, of each year. Okay, I understand that, but I'm not really sure where they came up with 1.1 pounds rather than just one pound. But I mean, it's not a problem. But I'm just just curious why they wouldn't just pick one pound. But um, nevertheless, so let's continue, and I'll sum up this. The I'll sum up the uh, materials and methods. Urea was applied to all plots except the potassium alone plot and the potassium nitrate treatments at a at an end rate of. Um, 4.9, so it's a tenth of a pound on the same date as potassium treatments. Urea applied at each apl application was equal to the amount of nitrogen applied from the potassium nitrate treatment. So what he's saying there is what the manufacturers and distributors are banking on you never doing, and that is balancing out the other components of the fertilizer. So they applied urea across the board except on the, nit except on the potassium sources that contain nitrate. They're not going to double up the nitrogen on those plots, right? So they're going to make sure it's all even. Yeah, yeah. So, can, by the way, the, uh, I, I never know, and when it says the grass factor, I, don't, I never know if it's Matt or uh, Ryan or JP. I don't know who that is, but I noticed you said Shadox. I got your, I got your, your comment in, the, uh, in one of the comments there, and it said Shadox too. I, I, don't, I don't know what you're... I don't know what you're getting at when you say shad ox. I'm not, I'm not sure what that is, but <laughs> I, I hope it's, I hope you're being friendly. I don't, I don't know what that means, but, but um, maybe, maybe someone needs to help explain it. He has my name hyphenated S H A D D slash ox. Um, no, it's Matt, but I don't, I don't know what that means. I, I, I guess it's nice. I don't know. <laughs> so I'll continue. Um, so they balanced out the nitrogen, which is what you, you probably will never do. They balanced out the other cations or the other, the other um, counter elements. Additional nitrogen fertilization, and they, applied, they, labeled the, they showed the amounts of nitrogen they applied, which is roughly a little a pound and a half or so a year in 2012, 13, and 14, was applied outside the treatment period to all plots, including the potassium alone plot and the potassium nitrate treatments during the fall and early spring in 2012, 13, and 14, respectively, to stimulate growth and recovery from anthracnose damage. So in other words, when the, when the treatments and the study was being conducted from the spring through, the, through November, there was no nitrogen applied ex ex except the urea to the, in a very specific manner to balance everything out. But when, this, when the uh, data collection and everything was done, from November until the next year when the study would start up again, they went ahead and applied, the, uh, applied nitrogen to all the plots to help the plots recover and all that stuff. Okay, so that's what they did with the nitrogen. The data collection and thracnose severity was assessed as the percent of turf area infested routinely from June through August. So that's what they did there. Turf grass quality was rated on whoa. Oh, turf grass quality was rated on one to nine scale. Four soil cores were taken per plot to a depth of 17 centimeters uh, with a 1.9 centimeter diameter probe. I don't know why I highlighted that. Oh, the verdure was removed from the sample cores, which were then divided into matte and sandy loam layers. The four samples were then uh, it combined for analysis of omega-3. So I'm just saying that when they took a soil sample, they, they, when they, here's what I'm talking about. When they took a soil sample, they separated out just the mat layer because that's where they determined all the roots were. Tissue samples were collected as well. And I'm not going to go through statistical analysis because uh, I would completely screw that up. I have no idea what they're doing in the statistics other than just the basic generals, generalities. They have various models that they use to measure area under the curve and all sorts of crazy stuff. And I'll say this, I have uh, done some relatively complex statistics, but I don't do it, okay? I call a statistician to do it. 
<laughs> UF statistician when I was at UF. And they are fantastic. Our cultural statisticians. They're your best friend if you're graduate students or even if you're faculty members. Don't think just because you've been published in 8, 9, 10, you got 40 publications that you're a statistician. You're not a statistician. You're, not, you're a horticulturalist. You're an agronomist or you're whatever. You're a turf scientist. You're a soil scientist. Let the statisticians be statisticians. And so whenever I'm writing something, the first thing I do before I even start the study is I run it by a statistician. And I say, this is my model. This is the question I'm asking. Is this correct? And if he or she, she says no, then I ask them, what do I need to do to adjust it? Because guess what's going to happen? When I send that in, I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a question from a reviewer who might have to happen to be a statistical purist, and I'm not going to be able to answer it because I'm not a statistician. But if I included a statistician from the beginning of the study, then the, stat, the statistical the st statistic question comes in, and guess what I do? I forward that right to my teammate who's the statistician. I say, hey, can you help me with this question? And he sends it right back. And they do this. They do it in their sleep. Okay. So the same thing goes here. I'm not going to read this because I would completely screw it up. I'm not a statistician. That's my limit. Um, so that's that. Okay. So the general maintenance of the plot before we get the results and conclusion, the general maintenance fungicides that were reported to be ineffective in controlling anthracnose were actually used to control some dollar spot and brown patch and summer, summer patch on the, on, and brown ring patch. So there was some fungicide applied to these, to these plots, but they were fungicides that were only were labeled for specific diseases and that would have no effect on anthracnose. Okay. So I want to make sure that that's clear. They intentionally avoided specific fungicides uh, to uh, to avoid any problems in, in, in controlling anthracnose so that if anything happened to anthracnose, it was likely to come from the potassium source. And you will search very, very long time before you ever find a better pathologist than the guys at Rutgers, okay? Because uh, <laughs> they're really good. Really good. Okay. Okay. Before I get the results and discussion, let me see if there's anything else going on in the, the chat. Uh, the grass factor says another YouTuber referred to me as Dr. Shad Ox, whoever that is. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, you were offended for me. Well, here's a, here's a trivia point. If does anybody know my, legal birth name that my last name at birth does anybody in the chat know that i have mentioned it not on the channel but i have mentioned it at various scientific talks just as a point of uh, humor and um if anybody types that in the chat unless you're my buddies from oklahoma don't don't you know if they're watching just <laughs> hold tight but if anybody knows my original name, that I actually changed it when I was in college, and it wasn't because I got married. I changed my last name when I was at Oklahoma State, and um, so that so that I, my existing name Shaddix could be on my diploma from OSU. You will impress the living but Jesus out of me if anybody types that name in chat, because it is perhaps one of the most unusual last names. Um. That you could come up with and the reason i actually changed it because i was because i couldn't order anything i couldn't order pizza because no one believed it was my last name i would call up and i'd say hey give me a you know, large pepperoni pizza or whatever who's it who's it for and i'd say who it's for and they would they'd either hang up on me or they'd say you can use that name as long as you use the name when we pick it up when you know because they didn't believe it was my last name so that'll that's a little trivia. I'll leave, I'll leave it out there and see if anybody can pick it up you know, before the next episode. Super TA says, that's how Ron Henry pronounced my name when someone brought your name up. Okay. Reed Grevin, it was always oh, from Ron Henry video when he mispronounced your name and the Grass Factor guys took him to, t oh, you guys had it. You guys talked about it or something. Eric. How do you pronounce your last name, Eric? Is it is it likeness or is it how do you pronounce your last name, Eric? I don't know. It seems like they're I don't want to mispronounce your last name. I haven't heard that name before. That's the same episode that sent you to this channel. Well, okay, well that's good. Uh 
Michael Conroy says my last name might be potassium. <laughs> I'll let it go. Maybe someone can Google it and find it. Maybe, who knows? You probably have it online somewhere nowadays. Okay, results and discussion. Anthracnose severity was similar. It is, it's lickness. Okay, lickness. Okay. Thank you, Anth Eric, for letting me know that. Anthracnose severity was similar between potassium alone and nitrogen alone fertilization treatments during 2012 and 14, but not during 2013. This is going to get a little tricky at first here, guys, but it, they clear it up real quick here, okay? So the potassium alone with no nitrogen and the nitrogen alone with no potassium, the, the fertilizer treatments during 2012 and 14, there was the same in terms of anthracnose severity, but not in 2013, okay? That's in table one. The, however, the potassium fertilization, the pooled nitrogen plus potassium treatments, reduced anthracnose severity compared to the nitrogen alone in all three years. Okay? So in other words, they had a couple of little treatments in there that were just N and just K. They didn't see a whole lot there. But when you pulled, pulled all these together and you looked at the nitrogen plus potassium treatments where it was all together, nitrogen and potassium, those re resulted in reduced anthracnose compared to just nitrogen alone. Okay? It's when you just apply potassium, they didn't seem to have as much of an effect as if you applied potassium with the nitrogen, okay? So well, it'll become clear, more clear in a minute. In general, potassium chloride was always among the least effective potassium sources at reducing anthracnose severity, but still resulted in considerably less disease than nitrogen alone plots. So that's what that's saying is KCL, the least expensive potassium source available on the market, did result in reduced uh, anthracnose. It just was not as effective as the other potassium sources. Okay? So if you're looking to spend the least amount of money and get some response, KCL is still a good option. It's just you want to really want to hammer the anthracnose on Poe and your greens. Then another potassium source may be more effective than KCL. Potassium sulfate plots had greater disease severity compared to potassium nitrate and potassium carbonate plots on, on the 1st and the 16th of July 2014, but had less disease than KCL. Potassium nitrate was always among the potassium source treatments with the least disease. This result might be due to the use of nitrate nitrogen in the potassium nitrate treatment versus the urea nitrogen applied to all other potassium source treatments. The reason for the reduced effectiveness of KCL treatments is not clear, but it may be related to the greater salt index of this fertilizer than the other potassium sources, as well as the chlorine content. I mean, we don't know. They don't know, and they just say they don't know. It might be this, and who knows what it is. Um, but it was very clear that KCL did result in beneficial response, but it wasn't near to the magnitude of the, as the other potassium sources, and we don't really know why. Could be the salt, could be the chlorine, could be something completely unrelated. We don't know. Um, but what we do know is that all the potassium sources res resulted in reduced uh, anthracnose compared to nitrogen alone, but they generally they were more effective when they were applied with a little bit of nitrogen. Okay, let's look at these graphs. If I can get them on the screen here. So on these graphs, we're looking at the anthracnose severity response to potassium sources. Okay, and on the y-axis, we have turf area infested. And on the x-axis, we have June, July, August, and September. And we have these line graphs that are from no potassium, potassium chloride, potassium sulfate, potassium carbonate, potassium nitrate. These guys, these researchers have some nerve, I'm telling you. To go out with that much resource, that many resources and that much invested to look at potassium that almost never has any beneficial response, very rarely, especially in the field, almost never. And they just... They jumped in with all with both feet, and that takes some serious courage to do that. And good for them, because they saw showed, they showed some really good re results. And what we find here is that if they didn't apply any potassium, the anthracnose severity peaked in August at about fifty percent, and it was lowest in early June at about ten percent. Now you have to understand, and we mentioned this last, uh, a day or two ago with Doctor Woods, you get plots about thirty or forty percent 
uh, disease on them. That's bad. I mean, don't don't think lightly of this. These are at 50. When you're at 30 or 40, it's bad. I mean, you're, you're, it is unacceptable. Your members are going to be unhappy. It, believe me. And this is at 50 when no potassium was applied. And when, it, when potassium was applied from any source, it dropped it from about 50 to about 20%. So you're cutting the anthracnose by more than half by including a potassium source in your program. And it didn't matter which source it was. Potassium chloride is right here. You can see it didn't quite have it as much of an effect in the, in the, uh, in the second year. It had less of an effect than it did even the first year. You can see the potassium chloride definitely had much more anthracnose at about 30%. And the other case, potassium sources were down near, say, high teens, 18, 19, 20%. So you do see a, you know, a pretty good separation between potassium chloride and the other potassium sources. But look, if you don't apply any, you're looking at 40, 50%, something like that, when you don't apply any potassium in, in August. The peak was, a, was the same, roughly the same, in about August for anthracnose on these poa greens. Okay? So this graph, I mean, to me, tells, tells the story. I mean, you don't need a whole lot more convincing information than, than, than these graphs. You applied any source of potassium, it helped. The potassium chloride was least effective. But if you don't do anything, you don't apply any potassium on a putting green, this was May like 3 of, I think it was 18, I think it was. You're at risk. It's pretty low potassium. Okay. Now let's go to. I'm not going to go over all this. This is uh, this. All this says is that malic three extracted potassium went up when you applied potassium. So this is just K rate going from zero all the way up to 4.4 pounds. And then these these are the different months of the year. And it just shows pretty much every month you apply potassium. Potassium in the soil goes up. I'm not going to go into that. Pretty pretty straightforward. But what I do want to go into is the next couple of, of figures, which I don't know if many people are familiar with figures like this. Um, oh, no, hang on. Okay, well, you got it. So, so, oh, here, oh, so in the chat, you guys got my name. So let's see here. So Chad Hamill, were you the first person to put that in chat? About to take off from Detroit airport. Have to go. I'll catch up with the, uh, Esteban Campbell. Okay, I'll see you next time, Esteban. And then Looney says outlaw for the win. So you just Googled it. So yeah, my, first, my, my legal last name when I was born was outlaw. Travis outlaw. So you guys Googled it and, and, and got that picked up. I figured you could do it nowadays online, no problem. And I was right. So yeah, my first name, my last name was originally outlaw. And the guys from OSU and from high school all know me as Travis outlaw. And, um, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. It was, it was ridiculous. You can't rent a car. You can't order a pizza. I mean, talk about, you know, whatever. I mean, just, I mean, it's, you can't you just, it was just because of a name people, you know, it's not, I wasn't making it up and there's other people named outlaw. It's, it's, it, it is an uncommon name, but I mean, it didn't seem to me to be that strange, but yeah, I changed it to Shaddix, which was my, my mother's maiden name. So there you go. Point of, point of trivia. Okay, so these are Kate Nelson models, which, which are very good at visualizing and depicting the influence of one variable on another when things group up in a certain way. And what we're looking at for those listening is we're looking at a graph or a figure that has malic 3 of potassium on the x-axis and relative area under disease, disease progression curve on the y-axis. Then we have another graph off to the side that is the exact same graph, but it's with tissue K instead of malic 3 soil K. And with this, these graphs, well, you will have four panels on them. And whenever the data falls into certain panels, it gives you an indication as to the likelihood of something occurring, you know, in that general area of, of this model. So what this does is it gives, it gives us an intersection where the, I don't even know how to describe this. To, to some degree, but again, I'm not a statistician, but basically this intersection right here where it says 40 something is this number right here where it says critical mat concentration is 43.4 uh, parts per million Malik three. So what this model determined or predicted is that 
you would need a critical, you would need a Malik 3 soil concentration of 43.4. That would be the critical level. If you fall below that, you're, you're greatly increasing your risk of anthracnose. And that's what you see. These dots up here in this top left panel are where anthracnose um, severity was, is beyond acceptable limits, essentially. And then all these dots down here in the bottom right-hand panel are all below that acceptable limit. I don't know what you want. That's probably not the way, easy way to say that, the right way to say that. But this line here, is this, this horizontal line is where they, it crosses a, a limit. I don't know where if, if it explains that in the... In the description but that's how to look at this and so you're going to read in the text here in a minute that this 43 parts per million malic 3 is what they deem on poa annua greens to be the minimum critical limit okay for potassium malic 3 potassium and i'm going to get to that because they actually make a very clear statement in the text and if you look at the at the tissue potassium you'll see a very similar graph where you'll see a whole lot of dots in the bottom right-hand corner, which is where the, the tissue potassium and the area under the curve, uh, the area under the curve for the disease is acceptable, I guess is what you could say that. And the tissue potassium, and it crosses here at 19.6, which is 1.9%. So what this graph is saying is, is that when the tissue, the potassium in the tissue was greater than 1.9%, the, the relative area under the disease progress curve was very, very, was low. And when it was um, when it was less than 1.9, it was very high. And when it was greater than 1.9 percent, the disease was very low. And the same thing goes for malic three potassium. When it was less than 43 parts per million, the disease was quite high. And when it was greater than 43 parts per million, the disease was quite um, what I say. The disease was quite high. And then was when it was greater than 43 parts per million, the disease was quite low. So you've me heard me mention in the past that I'm not a big fan of doing any uh, tissue testing on uh, uh, turf grass fluctuates all over the place month to month you know leaf to leaf it, it just it just fluctuates a lot but i have mentioned in some cases you can use it to help diagnose issues and this is the exact publication why i say that because in this publication they have a very clear and convincing argument to keep your poa annua tissue greater than 1.9% and if you happen to have diseases and you don't really know why, and you're like, listen, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing, you know, I'm putting all these things out, and I'm still getting this anthracnose, you can take a tissue test. And what this says is, is that if your tissue potassium in Poe Annual in New Jersey is less than 1.9%, you are probably going to benefit from the application of potassium to get that percent up higher. It's probably going to reduce the risk of anthracnose. This is why I say that. Okay. This, this exact panel is why I say that. And there's other, there's other, been some other publications as well, but this is what's on my mind the last several months when I've been saying there are some cases where you can use tissue analysis to help diagnose issues, but to use tissue analysis just to recommend fertilizer applications across the board is not wise. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So let's get into the, the, and that's, we're getting through this pretty quick, actually. Okay. The Kate Nelson model identified a significant negative relationship between the area under the disease progress curve and MAT concentration and estimated a critical MAT concentration of 43.4%. Now, let's listen to this next, this next little paragraph here, okay? <laughs> let's listen up. This critical potassium level in the MAT layer was less than the lower limit of the moderate sufficiency ranking for potassium suggested by Bob Caro in 2001, which is the book over my shoulder somewhere over here for recreational turf grass. But this level was greater than the minimum level of sustainable nutrient guidelines of 37 recommended by Woods in 2016. And this, this is not a refereed paper, but this is where MLSN comes from this Woods 2016. What this paragraph says, the authors are saying, not Travis, the authors are saying the critical limit that they determined through a proper modeling of the, of the soil potassium and anthracnose, that critical level was greater than the minimum level, the MLSN. So if you followed the MLSN, which is supposed to have a safety buffer put in there, and you're at, say, 30, 37, you're at 38, what that's saying is 
is that you'd still be at risk of anthracnose. You need to move the potassium level up a little bit on poanya greens if you want to avoid the risk of anthracnose or want to reduce the risk of anthracnose, I should say. Okay, so once again, the literature is, is more specific and more precise, and that's the reason I follow it rather than MLSN. And here's another example, okay? So now we're looking at turf grass quality. And here is, this is what a soil test correlation is supposed to look like. Okay, this is exactly what a soil test correlation looks like. We, got, we have a malic 3 mat potassium on the x-axis and turf grass quality on the y-axis. And what you do is, this, this is extremely common where you have a plateau, regression plateau model, or there's a lot of different ways to do it. This is called the linear plus plateau model is what they use down here. And what will happen is once you hit this cliff, it'll start going down fast. Okay, once the cliff is the minimum level and you start dropping down below that, the quality will decline rapidly. And I've used this analogy, I don't know how many times, the nutrient critical limits are literally a cliff. Okay. It's not like, uh, I can kind of look over that cliff and I'll be all right. No, you're going to slip and you're going to fall. It's going to go straight down. So between, you know, 50 and 100, it's all flat parts per million. 50 and 100 parts per million, make it three. 150 make it three. You don't see any more increases in, in quality. You can keep pumping and pumping and pumping the potassium on that plot. And it's not going to make a lick of difference in terms of turf grass quality. Once you hit the limit, you don't need to add much more. Maybe if, you know, if you want a little safety buffer or a little risk, risk, you're a little risk adverse and you want to move it from 50 to 60 or 70, no, you know, I don't have any problem with that. But know that you're just adding a little bit of safety buffers all you're doing. The quality is not going to go up. But once you get below that limit, it's... The, <laughs> It's, they're not playing games, I'm telling you. It's going to drop off fast. It is literally a cliff. And in this particular model, the previous one with the Kate Nelson was 43.4. And this one, the critical limit was exactly 50. 50.0 on a turf quality scale. This is a turf quality correlation. The other one was on a disease, uh, anthracnose disease correlation. In both cases, they're greater than the MLSN potassium level. So in both cases, if you followed MLSN, you're at greater risk of anthracnose on poa greens in New Jersey. If you hit tissue K, in this particular example, the tissue K ended up being 2.1% for quality. So it was a little higher than the, the, than the uh, tissue K to reduce anthracnose. You need a little higher tissue K in order to maximize quality. I don't, you know, I don't worry too much about tissue K. I don't, I don't take tissue tests and I don't recommend you take tissue tests unless you have a good reason. But if, if you can't diagnose the problem, that previous graph that I had on here, you know, that can help, that can help guide you though. Well, main fact it is potassium. I'm putting potassium out, but it's not getting in the plant. Maybe that's an issue and you can determine that through tissue analysis. Okay. Maybe you need to use a foliar application of potassium instead of a root application of potassium. If for some reason it's not getting in the plant, that might help guide your application management practices. A tissue test might help guide that. But I wouldn't, um, I, I don't condone the use of tissue tests just across the board. You need to have a specific reason to do it. And we're coming down to the end here. A linear increase in turf grass quality was observed while mat potassium concentrations increased from 23 to 50, at which point a plateau occurred and no additional improvements in turf quality was discernible. So 50 was the, was the limit. Okay, there's no need to continue to put in more potassium. That's what I showed. In general, potassium fertilization does not have a dramatic effect on turf grass quality unless the plant is exposed to stress and I've said that multiple times, or is growing under conditions of potassium deficiency, which I mentioned that multiple times, even in sandy soils, you have to have sandy soils that don't have potassium bearing minerals in them. If they're sandy soils that have potassium bearing minerals in, minerals in them, the soil test will not determine that. It, it's not good at, de, at predicting what the potassium level needs to be if it's a potassium bearing mineral sand. So even if it's 20 or 10, you, you say, well, I need to apply potassium, when in fact, if that sand has potassium bearing minerals in, minerals in them, you might not need to apply potassium. You probably don't need to apply potassium. Anyway, um, growing on conditions of potassium deficiency, which is possible explanation for limited turf quality or color responses to potassium in previous field studies. So basically saying we don't see response to potassium. You just don't see it. A significant linear plus plateau model relating turf grass quality to tissue K concentrations was also generated. A positive linear improvement in turf quality occurred when tissue K concentrations increased from 1.1 to 
to the critical level of 2.1%. So I just mentioned that, okay? Okay. The I'm I'm not going to talk about this, but this is basically the soil this is soil test correlated to tissue test. In this particular example, they did show some relationship here. Um it's not great. It's an R squared of 5. Point, or 0.58, but it's it's there. I mean, there's something going on there for sure. I've mentioned before we like to have, you know, 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 to have some confidence in it. Well, I mean, you can have confidence in it. The p value gives you the confidence, but to be able to predict it, you know, but it's not it's, you know, there's something there. At 0. 0.58 in the field study, that's not bad. And what basically what that says is is that it plateaus out when the Malik 3 hits, I guess it's probably close to 85. Oh, here it is, 85. Okay. There's no, you're not going to get any more in the tissue once the Malik 3 hits 85. But I don't think there's much of a need in that because once the anthracnose gets um, to controllable levels and the turf quality gets to acceptable levels, which is well below that 85 point, then there's who cares what's in the tissue? You see what I'm saying? That's the reason I don't put a whole lot of confidence or weight in that. I don't care what's in the tissue. What I care is what it looks like in the plant and give me some connection to what I care about. And they did in the other graphs. What I care about is the anthracnose. I care about the turf quality. That's what I care about. And they correlated that very well. Conclusions. The current study provides strong and consistent evidence that potassium fertilization can reduce anthracnose severity and that the severity of this disease can be correlated with mat, potassium, and tissue concentrations. So, you know, I'm not saying don't use tissue concentrations, tissue tests. I'm not saying don't do that. I've said do it for a specific reason. And in this study, they gave you a specific reason. And in this particular case, I would recommend doing that if you needed to. Moreover, this is the first study to document critical levels of potassium related to increased anthracnose severity and decreased quality of annual bluegrass turf during anthracnose epidemics. All potassium sources were effective at reducing anthracnose severity compared to nitrogen alone fertilization. However, KCL was not as effective as potassium nitrate, potassium carbonate, or potassium sulfate. Nonlinear regression models estimated the critical concentration of potassium in the mat layer was 43 parts per million malic 3 with the maximum tissue K level attained and mat potassium concentration at, at, a mat, at a mat concentration of 86 parts per million. So the critical concentration is 43 on Poania greens in New Jersey to reduce the risk of having anthracnose, you know, shut you down basically. Okay. Th thus, the sufficiency range for reducing anthracnose on annual bluegrass turf appeared to be between 43 and, and 86 milligrams per kilogram. What, the, what was that on tissue? The sufficiency range for reducing. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're just saying the, there's a sufficiency range between eight. So they're saying 43 is the, mo the bottom limit and 86 is the top limit. So they're calling that the sufficiency range. So at 43 is the minimum. 86, there's no point putting on any more at all. You're not going to gain anything above 86. So they're calling, they're, they're denoting the range, like what's high and what's too high or too low is like the minimum is where you start to drop off and the maximum is where you won't gain anything further from any further additions of potassium. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I mean, you know, Bruce Clark and Jim Murphy, can, they, they can pretty much do no wrong. I mean, and I don't know Chess Schmidt, maybe he's the same way, but those guys are rock stars. So they could, <laughs> they could do basically anything in my book. And I'd, 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 accept it almost i mean it's it's hard for me to so anyway the, however they define it i'm good with okay last sentence potassium fertilization rates of then this is the important part actually because i mentioned at the beginning when they solved the problem when they cured the potassium deficiency it wasn't with a lot of potassium it was just with a little bit and it says potassium fertilization rates of 1.1 pounds per thousand reduced anthracnose without potassium buildup in the mat or underlying soil layers, whereas potassium rates greater than 2.2 pounds, greater than or equal to 2.2 pounds, resulted in a buildup of mat and soil potassium. Thus, the fertilization at, at 1.1 pounds per thousand appeared to be sufficient to meet annual maintenance fertilization need of the annual bluegrass turf in this trial. So what he's saying is, we just applied 1.1 pounds per year, and it was enough. We applied 2.2 and 4.4. We didn't need it. So this idea that you're going to apply a stress blend, or you're going to add all this potassium and polymer coated potassium and really load up all the potassium in your, in your putting greens to eliminate or reduce the chances of having some sort of problem with your turf is way overblown. Just apply a little bit of potassium. Whatever benefit you're going to get from potassium is probably going to come from just a little bit. In this case, they applied one pound a year. 
They spaced it out. They spoon fed it over the growing season. And they just, total was about a pound. I, but I, I know guys that are putting out 10 pounds of K or more on their putting greens because they got to get all that potassium out. And all what this is saying very clearly, one, let's say you go to two pounds. Okay, let's say, you, let's say for some reason you're not safe. Yeah, I, can't, I don't want to go all the way down to one. I'm putting out 10 pounds. Just go to two pounds and space that out evenly every week or every two weeks throughout the season. That's going to get you whatever benefit you're going to get, okay, which is going to be minimal. But at least, you know, you're reducing the application of potassium by a huge factor if you just cut it to two pounds a year, okay? And that's all I got on that one. And hang tight because we got something fun at the end here. Uh, let me read the chat. Uh, duh, duh. I was going to ask any relation to Paul. Paul Outlaw? Is there, is there a Paul Outlaw? I don't know. My, oh, my uncle's name was Paul, but that was a different uncle from another side. Uh, oh, you guys are talking. I don't know. And Okay, that's all I got in the chat. Okay, this is the ne next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday morning, and then Thursday night. Next week will be the last open free week for non-members. So you can feel free. I have a, I'll have a hundred podcasts and a hundred videos that were all for free. I'll continue doing the Thursday night show for free, probably into perpetuity. And then next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday morning will be for free. It'll be open to everybody. And then when I come back from vacation, which will be the second or third week in April, I'll start the Monday morning show as members only. Okay, guys? Until then, if there's no more questions, I really appreciate everybody showing up. Um, the last little part here, just have some fun with it, okay? Just, just humor me. <laughs> all right, guys? All right. Thanks for all. We'll see you Monday morning. Bye. And now, Turf Thoughts by Ken Corley. I remember going out on the golf course early in the morning with my dad. I remember the smell of the grass and the sounds of the birds. I also remember the sound of the golf club as it made contact with the ball. What a satisfying sound. The last time I heard that sound was about five seconds before I woke up in the hospital with a fractured skull.